Welcome back to John chapter 16, um, and today we're, we're going to be working through um, kind of the Holy Spirit and persecution. So we're going to see a little bit of this. I picked fire as our um, background image for today, uh, really just because I think it, it well encompasses uh, both persecution and um, kind of how the Holy Spirit is, is described um, as this. There's, it's comes down, he comes down to us uh, in tongues of fire um, in Acts chapter 2. And so um, just a couple of things that I thought would be interesting uh, to have this kind of fire um, background. And so if that helps you, again, if you're a visual learner, uh, as you'll learn through these, hopefully this helps you guys just a little bit um, extra. So as we come into John chapter 16, as I was mentioning, um, fire is kind of why I picked this because uh, it kind of signifies persecution and the Holy Spirit and kind of how the Holy Spirit helps with persecution. So we're going to talk about that um, through this entire chapter as well as learn quite a bit about the Holy Spirit um, because there is a lot uh, contained about him in this chapter specifically. Uh, some context for John 16 um, is that the context of Jesus is continuing his discussion with the disciples as he comes closer and closer uh, to the crucifixion. And so I want us to notice that that's happening here, that, um, that this discussion has continued now over a couple of chapters. And so um, there's been a lot of time to build ideas. So if this is the first video you're watching, maybe go back to the beginning of these videos back in, um, in John chapter 13. So uh, make sure that you're starting in the right place for these videos. And notice the continued emphasis on his time has come. We've talked about that throughout. We talked about that very early on. Um, in this video series. Um, and so notice that that's continuing here. His time has come. Um, early in the gospel, we notice his time has not yet come. And so notice that that's happening here. And these things are clearly about to happen soon. Jesus is clearly predicting his death and his resurrection, as we will see in verses 25 through the end of the chapter. Um, persecution will come to those who believe, but we can take comfort in the fact that Jesus knows and will provide a helper. So notice what we're seeing here in John chapter 16, 1 through 6, as I read from those verses. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Notice what he has said. He, all the things that he's already said. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So notice what's happening is that persecution is coming and will come to those who believe. I want us to notice that, that is truly the case. In your small group handouts, you'll notice there's a question that asks, what is some of the worst persecution that you have, have seen uh, in the world? And I, I want to really dive into that because it's important. Because if we forget about that, we, we ignore a massive truth that Jesus is speaking here. But... It's also important that we realize that Jesus is sending and has already sent, from our perspective, a helper into the world. Something else to notice here is, I think, a little bit of, and I don't know if this is a veiled reference from John. Um, I can always kind of, I can only kind of guess at that, that might be. But John is written very late, and so he may be referring uh, kind of in a closed way to John, or to Paul. Uh, in his ministry. Because before Paul was Paul, he was Saul. He was formerly Saul. And he thought he was doing good when he went around killing and persecuting Christians. If you, you can read about that in Acts chapter 9 in his conversion um, account. And there's a couple of those conversion accounts of him. Uh, but in that one, you get to see that he was walking around breathing murder and threats against um, the Christians. Uh, on account of him being a Pharisee. So you can read more about that in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 to see that. But I thought that might be an interesting little aside for you guys. In John 16, verses 7 through 15, we get a glimpse into who that helper is. So we see the persecution and we know that it's going to happen. And so what has Jesus done to give us help through that? And so we're going to read those verses. Then we're going to look back over six attributes of the, the helper. 
It says in ver beginning in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So notice that we have this helper. And now we're going to go through a little bit of a list of things that this, who this helper is. So capital H, you'll notice that it's already speaking that the helper is the Holy Spirit, that he is God, that we should capitalize his name in that way, that we should see him as divine. So the first attribute that we see is that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a thing. He's not an object. He's not a he's not a, a, a power or a force. He is a person. As we read through this chapter, we notice that every time it speaks of him, it speaks of him with a personal pronoun, he, not it. So notice that that's happening because it's actually important for how we're going to build some extra stuff about the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person, the third member of the Trinity. In Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 4, we see that somebody, um, that somebody lies to the Holy Spirit, and it is, it is told um, of them that they lied to God, noticing that the Holy Spirit is God. Verse, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 5 says, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. Well, it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Here's the, the important part. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So notice that he's putting the Holy Spirit right alongside God as a member of the Trinity. We know that Jesus is also a member of the Trinity. So you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Third, we get to enjoy a relationship with him as Christians. In his benediction to the, um, to the Corinthian church, um, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, again, a small book in my hands, do not want to turn there today. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, so notice we have two of the people in the, two of the persons of the Holy Spirit, or of the Godhead, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So we get to enjoy a relationship, a fellowship with him as Christians. In the fourth point, he helps us to pray. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Now I would like for you guys to go and read that whole chapter. It's an amazing chapter. But in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, it says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Um, and he, he says what we ought to say. Romans chapter 8, we'll read those two verses really quickly so you guys can see them. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what, what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So he helps us to pray and he intercedes for us. And then the last two, he reveals truth to us. And these are both found in John chapter 16. He reveals truth to us and he convicts the world. We'll start out with convicts the world. We'll go out of order here um, just because they're in order by verses. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Notice that that is a sin in and of itself. Verse 10, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. The Holy Spirit will testify that Jesus Christ really was who he said he was. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Notice it is past tense. The ruler of this world is judged. Satan stands condemned by the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, I think this is very important for us to recognize. And then in verses 13 through 15, he reveals truth to his people. When the spirit of truth comes, again, this is the Holy Spirit, 
He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Notice that he says in verse 15, all that the Father has is mine, all this truth. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit will, will reveal truth, and he does. We notice that happen after the Gospels by the Apostles' writings in the later part of our New Testament. So notice that he's doing all of that through this passage. And I really want us to boil that down because in 17, we're going to see Jesus is praying. He's praying to the Father and he prays this high priestly prayer. And so I want us to notice that we're going to get a really big dose of the Holy Spirit right here. And then we're going to get a really big dose of the Son again. So I want us to notice that that's happening. In verses 16 through 24, Jesus says these words, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. And I think at this point, with all the words, we're probably in a little bit of the same boat. But I want us to recognize the main idea here is verse 16. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So what is he talking about? Well, we can make a guess, but we'll talk more about that when we finish reading this verse. 19, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you were asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. So notice, his disciples will be sad, the world will be happy. You will be so sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So notice that Jesus is boldly predicting his death and his resurrection. He's saying, a little while and you won't see me. And then a little while after that, you will see me again. And what he's saying is, I'm about to die. I'm about to raise back to life. And in that middle term, you're going to be freaked out. You're going to be sad. You're going to be sorrowful. And we see that in the Gospels. But there's hope because Jesus will resurrect. He will come back to life to spend a little more time with his disciples until ultimately leaving to ascend to the Father and to continue to rule in heaven. So I want us to notice what's going on there because Jesus is boldly predicting his death and his resurrection. One thing I want to notice here is that in verse 20, what does the cross and Jesus' resurrection accomplish for us? From verse 20, we can see that, we will, that his disciples will be sad but that sadness will turn into rejoicing because of how amazing it is that, that he, has, he has resurrected from the dead. So notice, again, he is doing something here that he's foreshadowing what will happen to come. Jesus paid it all for his people. That's what's happening in this verse. He's saying, I'm going to pay it all, but you don't even know what that means yet. So I'm going to die and I'm going to come back. And you're gonna, there's going to be blessings like you would not believe because of that action. Christians have direct access. So now after moving into verses 25 through 28, we'll quickly read that. But I want us to come into that with the idea that Christians have direct access to God, the Father, by the Son. We don't have to have a human high priest. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. So notice there's some amazing things happening here, not least of which in verse 28 is saying that, God, that Jesus came from the Father, meaning he has been eternal. But leaving that immense rabbit hole because that, that could be a whole other study in and of itself. But I want us to recognize that we as Christians today have direct access to 
God by the Son. That is amazing. We don't need a priest. We don't need a high priest. We don't have to do any of that. He has opened that door to us. He has removed the veil to the Holy of Holies from the Old Testament. And so I want us to notice that because if we don't, we don't have really the prayer that we ought to be able to have. Your question sheets will bring that up as well. Do we pray as if we have direct access to the Father? Then the disciples seem to finally start to get it. They say, his disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. So the disciples seem to finally get it, but what will their actions say? Because again, something is going to happen here in the next couple chapters. Hint, hint, his resurrection, his death and resurrection. And so if that's going to happen, what will the disciples do during that time? Jesus knows that his disciples will scatter and flee under persecution, but he knows that they will eventually come back. And this action will pay for the sins of his people, this action of the cross and his resurrection. And it must be accomplished by Jesus alone. And then we come to Jesus' last words to his apostles, and he says, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. These are Jesus' last words to the disciples in the gospel according to John before the cross. 